All right, welcome to Random Stuff, episode five. In this episode, we will experiment with some 8048 family microcontrollers, and we'll build a circuit and write some programs and blink LEDs and get button inputs and things like that. And I think it's worth mentioning, why the heck are we doing this? Uh, from my perspective, I think the 8048 family is a really fascinating uh, device. It was one of the first commercially successful microcontrollers, got built into you know tons and tons of, of things. I think it was uh, very widely used in automotive applications. Uh, it was the microprocessor in the Magnavox Odyssey 2 video game system, and it was also the predecessor to the even more wildly successful 8051 series of microcontrollers. And so these are both 1970s era technologies. Of course, if you've watched this channel at all, you know that that's an era of technology that I uh, really enjoy. And, you know, it, it's really satisfying to actually build things out of these uh, these ancient relics and just kind of get a sense of what they can do. I also have another motivation for doing this, which is about 18 years ago, I wrote a cross-assembler for the 8048 for no reason whatsoever, just that I was bored and knew that the 8048 existed and thought it would be fun to write an assembler for it. So I am actually going to use my own assembler for the very first time to actually write some code for this, this ancient weird chip. Uh, okay, let's get started. So here is a very quick overview of the 8048 family. So the, the three main devices are the 8048, 8049, and 8050. They are distinguished by the amount of ROM, program memory that they contain, 1K, 2K, and 4K respectively, and the amount of RAM, 64 bytes, 128 bytes, and 256 bytes respectively. Uh, you know, this doesn't seem like a lot of memory, but for the types of applications that these chips were used for, you can definitely do a lot in terms of embedded control and sensing types of applications in that small amount of memory. This is, of course, mask ROM in these devices, meaning you had to write your fir firmware program and send it to the factory, and it's actually built into the device. Uh, for these devices, but, and this is the reason that this, it's actually possible to write your own programs uh, for these devices, is that there is a pin which, if asserted high, allows the device to run programs from an external ROM device, and of course that's what we're going to do in, in our circuit. The disadvantage, of course, of doing this is that two of the I.O. ports wind up being used for uh, the data bus and address bus in order to interface the chip with the external ROM device, and that means that a lot of those pins are thus not available for I.O., but that's, you know, that's how it goes. There are EEPROM programmable versions of the 8048 and, and 8049. I don't have any of them, and even if I did, I don't own a programmer that would program them, so we'll, we'll just go with the external ROM setup. Uh, okay, so let's look at a circuit. All right, so let's take a look at our initial application, which is just, is just a very simple LED blink circuit. And there's basically, there's quite a bit of supporting circuitry because there are three things that we are going to need. We are going to need a way of generating a reset signal. We are going to need an address latch due to the way that external memory references work on the 8048. Uh, and then of course we'll need a ROM chip and we'll use an EEPROM device. To generate the reset, we will use my favorite reset generation IC, which is the MAX708, and the active low reset output of the MAX708 gets fed to pin 4, which is the reset input of the 8048. I honestly am not sure whether you can use the trick that we used with the 8051, where you just uh, have a capacitor charge up to generate the initial reset. As far as I'm aware, that does not work on the 8048, so we just use a sort of standard uh, external reset generation IC. So much like the 8051, the 8048 series devices, when they are interfacing with external peripherals and external memory, use uh, an 8-bit port both as the data bus for you know, bi-directional communication with peripheral devices, but this data bus is also used for the low 8 bits of generated addresses. So we use a 74HCT573 as the address latch. So when the microcontroller asserts the ALE, address latch enable output, that tells the address latch that it should save the low eight address bits that are generated on this port as the outputs of the address latch. And so that's how the 
low eight bits of generated external addresses are captured. And then the, the next three bits of external addresses are generated directly on the low bits of port two over here. And those, we only have one external device in this circuit, which is our 8K uh, EEPROM. So that's how we interface the, the microcontroller to the external ROM. The other control signal that is relevant is this uh, PSEN signal. So that's program space enable. That is asserted, it's active low, that's asserted by the microcontroller when it is fetching an instruction from the external ROM. And so that gets fed here to the output enable signal of the EEPROM. So we don't need any address decoding because there's only one external memory device. So we, we just sort of uh, unconditionally enable the, the ROM's chip enable. But we will know that the microcontroller wants to fetch data from the ROM because it will assert this PSEN signal. All right, so here is our first test program. The 8048 family devices have their reset vector at address zero in program memory. So we set the assembler origin to address zero. Here is the, the reset vector. We just jump to the entry point, which is at address 16. That is the top of the loop that just executes a bunch of NOP instructions and then jumps back to the top of the loop and does that ad infinitum. And obviously it's not a very interesting program, but what we should see is that when this program runs, we can look at the low address lines on the address latch. And essentially we should see the low address lines counting up as instructions are fetched starting at address 16. And that should allow us to verify that the program is actually running. All right, so to assemble the program, we use the uh, ASM48 assembler. So let's do that. All right, so uh, we've assembled loop.asm into loop.bin. That's the, the binary code. So let's load that into the MiniPro software. All right, uh, all right so uh, binary format. All right, and so there is our assembled program. Obviously not very big and doesn't do anything very interesting, but that's okay. So let's program it onto the chip. So I, I do have an 8K EEPROM in the programmer, so let's program that. And okay, that looks good. Uh, all right, so next step, let's see if this actually works in the circuit. All right, so here we have our test circuit on the breadboard. So here's the 8049, uh, this one seems to be uh, made by Philips, interestingly. Here's our address latch, EEPROM, here's the uh, reset chip. And it's powered up, it's drawing about 50 milliamps, which sounds about right, it's not drawing excessive current. So what I'm going to do is look at the low address lines. So here's uh, A0, A1, A2, A3, A4. I, I think our loop was less than 16 bytes, so we should see about four or five address bits that are toggling uh, if the instructions are being fetched the way that we expect them to. So here I'll get ground. All right, so here's a zero, and I'm getting 368.6 kilohertz. That seems about right. And if I go to A1, I get 184.3 kilohertz. I think that's exactly half or about half, which would be uh, perfect. And then here's A2, 122.8 kilohertz, A3, 61.4 kilohertz, and A4, let's see, uh, A4, if I could get that. Um, A4 is not toggling at all. And that actually makes sense if, um, that actually makes perfect sense if the loop is about 16 bytes. So this seems to be working as far as I can tell. Um, maybe the next thing to do is, uh, let's go for broke and try to blink the LED. Why not? All right, so here is our LED blink program. So the main loop repeatedly copies all one bits to port one and all zero bits to port one, to essentially toggling all of the pins uh, on and off. The LED will light up when the pins are driven low. That allows current to flow through the LED into the pin, lighting it up. And there is a delay function that causes the program to pause for a little bit. And the delay function uses nested loops. So uh, the 8048 really doesn't have any 16-bit data values or registers. So we have an outer loop and an inner loop, both of which essentially are just counting down from 255 to zero, just wasting some some, some time so that we can actually see the LED blinking on and off. All right, so so let's make sure that the program is compiled. Um, okay, so there we go. Let's load it onto the EEPROM. There we go. Uh, program. 
Okay, so let's see if it works in the circuit. Okay, here we go. Here's the EEPROM programmed with the LED blink program. So let's power up the power supply. And there we go. Here's the LED blinking. This is pin zero of port one that is being driven high and low. And uh, this is pretty amazing. We have this uh, ancient weird device and we have successfully uh, written a program for it. So um, now that we are confident that we have our software environment and of course our test circuit working correctly, let's try to do some digital input by connecting a push button switch and using it to control the LED. Okay, so here is how we are going to modify the schematic to uh, connect a push button. We'll connect it to pin seven of port one. So we'll put the uh, push button like this, and then uh, basically it's going to uh, pull that line to ground when the button is pressed. So um, very much like the 8051, the 8048 has quasi bidirectional IO ports. And so essentially when you write a one bit to a port register, it enables a pull-up resistor that pulls up these pins to VCC using a fairly weak pull-up resistor. I think the data sheet says something like 50K. And so um, there is internal circuitry that when you read from the, the corresponding port, it basically measures the voltage on the pin and compares it to uh, a logic level. And essentially any uh, output that is capable of driving the uh, the voltage to ground will produce a zero there. Uh, but if the voltage is either driven high or left floating, the internal pull-up will ensure that the voltage goes high and a one will be read. So essentially when the button is pressed, we expect to see a zero on that pin and if the button is released, then we'll see a one on that pin because the internal pull-up will pull the, uh, pull the pin to a high voltage. All right, so here is our test program for button presses. Usual stuff here, jump to a, an entry point. So the R0 register is going to contain the bit pattern that we want to continuously output on port one. And we treat every bit as an input except for pin zero, bit zero, which of course is the one that the LED is connected to. So initially we set all of the pins to high. So all of the internal pull-ups are enabled. So we get a high output on pin zero. And we also allow a voltage, a digital voltage to be read from all of the other input pins. And then our loop uh, continuously outputs that current bit pattern onto port one. And then we read port one and we test to see if the high bit is one or zero using this and uh, bitwise and instruction. And so if the high bit is one, that means that the button is not pressed. So we go to the button not pressed label and then the, va the next value that we're going to output on the port contains all ones, including a one on bit zero, which of course is the one that drives the LED. And if that pin is driven to a high voltage, the LED will not light up because it's cathode is connected. But if we get a zero on the high bit, that means that the button was pressed because the button is connecting that pin to ground, meaning that we'll read a zero on that high bit and we'll fall through here. And so we set up the next bit pattern to write to port one to be a bit pattern that contains a one in every bit except for the low bit. So because we are driving pin zero low, the LED will turn on. So this is all just a fancy way of achieving through software the phenomenon that when we press the button, the LED will light up. So, okay, let's see if it works. All right, so here is our test circuit with the uh, button press program loaded into the EEPROM. So if I press the button, the LED does indeed light up. So even though this seems like a fairly trivial program, this is really the essence of embedded sensing and control, which is we read a sensor and we produce uh, an output. And so uh, we, we really could do arbitrary sensing and control using this circuit.
All right, so as one last test program, we're going to use the timer interrupt to generate a cyclical pattern on the output port P1 to control eight LEDs and we'll display a little uh, holiday light pattern. So using the timer interrupt on the 8048 is actually pretty simple. The vector for the timer interrupt is at program address seven. So uh, we'll just jump to this timer event function and basically it countdowns repeatedly a value that's in the R4 register until it reaches zero. Every time it reaches zero, it loads a different pattern from an array of patterns. And then the main loop of the program just repeatedly uh, copies the pattern uh, that is stored in R0, which is set by the interrupt routine. It copies that pattern to port one and that generates the pattern of LEDs on the LEDs. All right, so let's give this a try. All right, so here are our holiday LEDs connected to port one. So let me fire up the bench power supply and there we go. So this is our little uh, cyclical uh, light display that we are showing on, on these LEDs. So it is Christmas day as I am recording this. So this is my little holiday fun using the Intel uh, 8048. So yeah, this works quite well. All right, so in conclusion, uh, I was pretty surprised with how fun the 8048 was to work with, and it was actually reasonably pleasant to write code for. I was a little bit surprised by that, and it definitely does feel like a Proto 8051 chip. You can definitely see you know, why the 8051 is the way it is. I was able to verify that uh, my assembler works just fine, so that was satisfying, and I finally used it for its intended purpose. All right, so that's it for this video. Um, I I am planning to make some more videos in the very near future. Uh, my academic semester is done, so I have uh, a, a few weeks of relative free time when I can do some fun stuff. So definitely planning on continuing the audio amplifier series and definitely the 6809 computer series. So I will see you in the next video.